verse number 17 of Jeremiah chapter number 32. The Bible said, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Isn't that wonderful tonight? Isn't that a good prayer to pray when you're talking to God and telling him that there's nothing too hard for him? It goes down a few verses, and when we get to verse number 26, it is not Jeremiah speaking any longer, but now we hear and we find that it is God responding to the prayer of Jeremiah. And in verse number 26, the Bible said, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh. Jeremiah said it in a declaration, a a, a declaratory statement. He said, there is nothing too hard for God. But in your King James Bible tonight, we find that God did not say it in a uh, declaration method, but rather it is in a uh, interrogatory way. He said, is there anything... Too hard for me. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd take your word and speak to us tonight. And Lord, we'll be very careful to give you the praise and the glory. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray and ask it, and all God's people said, you can be seated. God, speaking back to Jeremiah asks this question, is there anything too hard for me? I would remind you that our God is a massive God. He is a singular God all by himself. He is the pre-existing God. He's the omniscient God. He's the omnipotent God. He's the omnipresent God. He's God all by himself. He was God before we ever got here. He's been God while we are here. And he will be God after we are gone. God is an omniscient God, meaning that he knows everything. There is nothing and there's never been a time that anything has occurred to God because he is all things and he knows all things and he created all things and nothing has ever taken God by surprise. Therefore, God never asks a question because he is looking for an answer. In the book of Genesis, Adam, where art thou? God did not ask where he was because he didn't know where he was. God already knew where he was. And God already knows where you are. God is not asking a question because he's looking for an answer. God asks questions so that you will find out the answer. And literally echoing off the pages of Jeremiah chapter number 32, down through the corridors of time, this question has bounced off the pages of your Bible and into the ears of the people of God around the globe, asking the question knowing that they would be facing hard circumstances, knowing they would be dealing with hard situations, knowing that they would be dealing with a bad doctor's reports, knowing that they would have more more bills than they would have money, having situations within their home and within their family that they did not have solutions for, knowing that there would be things that made them weep and cry and feel like they were at the end of their road. So God let this 
these words echo off the pages of your Bible. Is there anything too hard for me? Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to answer that question that there is nothing too hard for my God. There is no mountain that is so high that he can't get up there. There's no valley so low that he can't descend to it. There is no obstacle that is so bad that God can't detour around it. There is not some cell so small in your body that my God, I feel like preaching tonight now. There is no cell in your body that is full of sickness that the great physician can't reach down with his healing touch and touch it and heal it. I come to tell somebody that he is a big God and your problems may be big to you but our God is bigger than every mountain, every valley, every storm, every trouble and every trial. I'm not here. I didn't drive all this way and leave my family behind to testify about a small God or a weak God or a tired God but I come to brag on a God that is the great I am. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright morning star. He's the sweet rose of Sharon. He's the great I am. And no matter what you're dealing with, good God Almighty, he's God. And he is able to do what you need him to do tonight. There are no promises too big for my God to keep. In Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, our Bible tells us God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent hath he said and shall he not do it or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good. There are 8,810 promises in the Bible. 7,487 of those are promises that God made to man. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse 20, the Bible said, for all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. F.B. Meyer once said, if any promise of God should fail, the heavens would clothe themselves in sackcloth. The sun and the moon and the stars would reel from their courses and the universe would rock. And hallow wind would moan through the ruined creation, the awful message that God can lie. But child of God, what a good news and what a good report to let you know that God is not a man that he should lie, but he has has an impeccable reputation and he has an impeccable stance upon if he says it it shall come to pass. You want to doubt this Bible and you want to doubt God but rather I've got 66 books of God's mind on paper and not one single time can you find from the Old Testament unto the New Testament where God has spoken and not been able to accomplish that which he said. I'm telling you He's not a man that he should lie. Matter of fact, every now and then, it is good for you and I to run through the pages of this Bible and see where God said that he was going to do something and then watch watch God flex his muscles and do it. You see, in the Old Testament, the rains fell and the waters rose and Noah and the whole world was flooded and Noah and his people were delivered on the ark, but God put that rainbow in the sky, declared declaring his promise uh, that he would never destroy the world uh, by water again. Uh, And here we are in 2024, and the waters have tried to get out every now and then, uh, but they are held back by the promise uh, of a holy God. Uh, Abraham was the father of a great nation, uh, and the birth of his son Isaac, uh, when he was old, it looked impossible. He was old. His wife was old. They were beyond the time where it was possible. God, why would you give us a promise like this? 
when there's no way to fulfill that promise. But aren't you glad that God is not bound by walls of physics or science or biology, but he was the God that created the body. He's the God that made the body. And if anybody can bypass what the body usually does, it is God himself. As God kept the promise to Abraham, the birth of John. Do you remember where John's father was told that he was going to have, they were going to have a baby? The same situation. It's impossible. It doesn't look like there's any way, but rather whether God sealed, the angel sealed the mind and the, the mouth of John the Baptist's daddy because he didn't want him to talk about it. Oh, but over there we go a little bit further and we find that, 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 that John is born and inside the belly of his mama, they walk in the room and in another belly, Jesus is in Mary's belly and they walk in the room and we find that when Mary and Elizabeth walk up to one another, John the Baptist in one belly and Jesus Christ in the other belly, the Bible said that John leaped in his mother's womb because he got that close to Jesus. Oh, because God, Jesus is the Savior that keeps his promises. We find the birth of Jesus and the promise of the Holy Ghost and the promised resurrection all throughout your Bible. You'll find promise after promise after promise after promise and time after time after time. You will find a God that said there is nothing too hard for me. If I make a promise, I can keep that promise. Here's one, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Yeah. Uh, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. I'm glad today, here's, here's a good promise. I'm going to need about 30 Baptist people to leash out on this one. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. I thank God that all through this Bible, I thank God that I have the ability to call out on a holy God and know that my God hears my prayer and knows where I am. And God is a God that can keep his promises. You and I as the people of God ought to grab this Bible and hang on to it like a life preserver in the midst of rocky seas. And no matter what you see, and no matter what you feel, and no matter what you think, you cannot live your life based on how you feel. And you can't live your life based on what you think. And you can't live your life based on what you see. But you got to find you a promise in that Bible and know that God is able to keep that promise. He's a promise keeping God tonight. There are no promises too big for God to keep. There, are, there, there is no person too lost for God to save. There is no person too lost for God to save. In Jeremiah chapter number 32 and 28, the Bible says, I'm about to give this city into the hands of the Babylonians and to Nebuchadnezzar. This pagan king whom because of their rebellion, God said, I'm going to give this city into the hands of the Babylonians and to Nebuchadnezzar. A pagan king a wicked king, an ungodly king, but by the end of his life, something took place. This pagan king saw the light. He realized the error of his ways. The last words this pagan king is ever recorded to say in the book of Daniel are these, and I quote, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways, judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. If God can reach the heart of a wicked man like that, then God can reach a wicked heart in this city. I thank God for time after time after time 
when I've been in meetings like this and people have prayed and asked the Lord to do a miracle, when mamas or daddies have come and prayed saying, please pray for my children, please pray for this or that, and, and maybe to the point where they thought God never is going to answer that prayer, only to see God work and move in such a way that he saves to the uttermost that which we thought he never could save. How many more times do we have to see God do it just like that? In my mind, my brain's firing over the different stories I've seen God do. But I'll tell you, since Brother Randy Hobbs is here, and Miss Lisa, and Melissa, and Nathaniel, that's my Burlington family. They're all with us from Burlington, where the Burlington Revival was. When we were in the Burlington meeting, was his name Clint? Clint. Clint would come to church, and he had a shouting mama. I mean, she didn't give a rip what nobody thought about how she's going to go to church. She would pray and pray and pray. And many times during those meetings, uh, we would pray for God to save old Clint. But he was hard-headed. He was stubborn. He was lost. He knew he was lost. He would come to church and would sit on that pew and would weep and cry and squall and hold on to that pew. You could see white knuckles as he would hold on to that pew and would run out. Man, we prayed many times. God save Clint. God reach Clint. God do something to get a hold of old Clint. But, but he would just sit through those services. And just sit there with a hard heart and wouldn't get saved. Was it on a Sunday? It was a Sunday morning in the middle of all that. The crowds wasn't there. Nothing big was going on. And I mean his mama just over there praying and all kinds of stuff. And she went to heaven, I believe. Is that right? And she, she went to heaven. Old Clint came. And the Holy Ghost dealt with Clint's heart that night, that day, during on a Sunday morning in church. And I'll never forget. I mean, we just have a normal church. It wasn't in the clouds. I mean, it wasn't like 50 million people in the altars. It wasn't like an amazing emotional experience in God's house. But the Holy Spirit many times does His best work when we're quiet. I'm up there behind the pulpit thinking I'm a failure. They're going to kick me out of this town. Ain't nothing going good. I, I, I'm not preaching no good. And here comes Clint barreling out of that seat. And I thought he's going to the bathroom or he's mad at me one. He's leaving the church and ain't never coming back. And about that time, Clint, instead of turning that way, I mean that big old burly man coming down that aisle just to sobbing. And that whole church, like a filing cabinet, just started filing in behind Clint. I mean, the whole entire church, when they saw him coming, the whole every aisle just they went to shouting and carrying on. And big old Clint fell on the by the testimony of the people in that town. They testified Clint was one of the roughest, toughest, drinkingest men in that town. Tattoos all up and down his arm, big old strong neck of a man. Man, I mean, he come down there, fell on that altar, and I mean, we joined around him, and with my own ears, I heard Clint call out to God, asking God to save him, asking God to forgive him, asking God to move in his heart, and to this day, every now and then, I still get a text message from that man by the name of Clint, who's praying for me, who loves that man of God, and loves that church, you telling me that God can't save them, I'm here to tell you, I don't care how drunk they are, I don't care how I addicted. I need somebody to help me now. I don't care how long they've been out there. We've got a God that shed his blood on Calvary that has the ability to take your black heart, wash it in red blood, and it'll come out as white as snow. I I wish y'all could see how powerful my Savior is. He still has never met one person that he doesn't have the ability to save. I'm telling you, keep praying mama. Keep praying daddy. Keep praying preacher. It it ain't over till God says it's over. God can still reach them by the power of God. And one of the biggest reasons you ought to know that's the truth is because he saved you. <laughs> yeah. I said one of the biggest reasons you ought to know that is because he saved you. I 
was a snotty-nosed, wicked preacher's kid. Yeah. I don't know what liquor tastes like other than Baptist liquor, and that's NyQuil. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I don't. I ain't never tasted liquor. I ain't never smoked dope. I don't know nothing about drugs. I, I, I ain't never been around none of that stuff. But hear me. I needed... The, the, I, I, I needed the same amount of blood to cleanse my religious nasty heart as the worst drunk in town. God don't see him as terrible sinners here and easy sinners there. We're all sinners away from God. But aren't you glad? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Aren't you glad that God has the ability, whether you're a Sunday school kid or you grew up on a bar stool, God has the ability to set your soul free. I tell you, sometimes it's probably a little bit harder for a church kid to get saved sometimes because you grow up thinking you're saved. It's hard to see the cross when you're standing right under it. But I'm so grateful that the power of the Holy Ghost has the ability to just boom right through religion and boom right through your opinion and boom right through everything you think and show you that you're lost and on your way to hell. And the Holy Ghost has the ability to save by the power of God. Huh. For a long time, I traveled down a long, lonely road. My heart was so heavy, in sin I sank low, but then I heard about Jesus. Oh, what a wonderful hour. I'm so glad that I found out <laughs> he could bring me out. Through his holy power, thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been born again. Oh, hallelujah. I'm saved, saved, saved by his wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out. Like a bird out of prison that's taken its flight. Like a blind man that God gave back his sight. Like a poor wretched beggar who found fortune and fame. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out and show me the way. Help me sing now. Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been born again. Hallelujah. I'm saved, saved, saved. By his wonderful grace, I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out and show me the way. It's good to be saved tonight. It's good to be free tonight. I said it's good to be on the winning side tonight. Come on now, y'all shout out a football game and you shout out a baseball game and you shout over everything else in this world, but let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if you're on your way to heaven, if God's your Father and heaven's your home, somebody give God praise under this tent and thank God that you're free. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Glory. Glory to God. I'm saved to the uttermost, and I know that I am washed in the blood of the... Through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost, I'm saved to the uttermost. It's good to be saved tonight. <laughs> I'm glad that we can rejoice about being saved. You see, some of y'all, we, 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 we've learned how to shout and worship about shallow stuff. Now, I sing them. I like it. For food on our table, shoes on our feet, clothes on our... Y'all pray for Ben. He's already coming to the altar. I thank God. I've been waiting on him to come to the altar. We shout over all this stuff. God, thank you for a roof over my head, and you should. God, thank you for clothes on my back, and you should. God, thank you for shoes on my feet, and you should. But hear me. If all you can shout and weep and thank God for is the good stuff and the things you have in this life, what you going to do when all your stuff goes away? Ain't none of this in my notes. I don't know why I'm staying here. Maybe I, I guess I guess I need to. Some of y'all still looking like it. If all you can shout about is a roof over your head and shoes on your feet, what you going to do when that house burns down? What you going to do when health leaves that body? What you going to shout about when you ain't got nothing to die? You ain't got a dime to spend in there. I'm here to tell you, if you've been saved by the grace of God, if your name has been recorded in the Lamb's book of life, if God is your father, if heaven is your home, you got something to shout about when this whole world loses all its splendor and all its joy. I'm here to tell you, it's high time that the church got to shouting and the church got to rejoicing over Jesus, over the over the blood of the lamb because all your stuff can go away but like Job said though he slay me yet will I trust him if I lose it all I still got a shout if I lose it all I still got something to give God glory hallelujah hallelujah I'm saved I'm washed in the blood I'm headed for heaven glory to God what's his name Blake Blake's my little buddy where y'all live at London Kentucky these people show up just about everywhere I preach I fly because it's so far and I look down and they're there I go here and people look at my, my buddy a little bit weird. He was born cerebral palsy. He's got a trach. His mom and dad take care of him every moment of every day. He can't do much with his hands. He can't talk with his voice. But every time they come, they put him somewhere on the front row. And they say, man, ain't he going to get in the way? I've had preachers walk, do you want him up there? Is, is that, is that going to be okay? They don't know him. I said, that's my shouting team. Leave them alone. Because when all you, are, listen to me, it ain't time to clap now. When all you dead, dried up Baptists, I can't get a, I can't get a, a holy hum out of you. And Blake comes up here. He ain't got no voice. And he can't really work his hands. So he'll come up. He'll shake my hand with his foot. And he'll praise God with his foot. And these little feet will be all over the place. And some people think, what in the world's going on? That boy knows about who I'm preaching about. That boy knows who we're singing about. And while you got everything perfect in your life and you can't even say hallelujah and you can't say amen, Blake's on the front row giving God praise and giving God glory. I'm telling y'all, he's worthy of the glory. He's worthy of the praise. Listen to me, Mr. Sophisticated. If he can praise God with his feet, why can't you praise God at all? A 
Oh, Brother Townsend, I, I, I enjoy watching you do all this. I, I enjoy, I've come every night. I enjoy watching you get fired up, but it, I'm, I'm just not that style. I, <laughs> hey, Jack, it's not a matter of if you worship. It's a matter of what you worship. Some of the very people that sit in my church every Sunday. That act uncomfortable when we go to shouting like we've been doing tonight. You go put them on their favorite football team's 50-yard line. And let's just pretend for a minute that Tennessee did win a game. Can we just pretend that for a second? Let, let's pretend for a second that Tennessee did win a game. And, 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 and they wind up back in that pocket and throw that football in there. And the one second goes off the clock and your favorite receiver leaps into the end zone, catches that ball, tucks it in, and the sign goes up, touchdown, and Tennessee wins the football game. See? Some of y'all ain't shouting at all. And you shouting right in my illustration. Good old rocket. And here we go. Hold your purse, ma'am. Hold your purse. Hold it. But you come in here. And can't get a holy grunt out of you. Whoever told us that you got to act like you're in a funeral home the whole time you're going to church, lied to you. No wonder the world don't want nothing to do with the church because they form, find more life out in the world than they do in the house of God. You can predict the church services tell exactly what's going to happen before it ever happens. And I'm here to tell you that one of the things we need revival in this day and hour is there needs to be life in the house of God again. There needs to be power in the house of God again. I'm not talking about emotionalism. I'm not talking about drumming it up. But every now and then, there ought to be something that rises up in your heart and says, God, thank you for saving me. God, thank you for dying for me. God, thank you for loving me. Hey, mama, if you don't worship at all, guess what your daughter's going to grow up and do? Hey, daddy, if you don't worship at all, guess what your boys are going to grow up and do? Hey, preacher, if you don't worship at all, guess what your people are going to do? When people walk in the church, I get the privilege to pastor. I know they've been beat up by the devil all week long. I know they've been facing hell by the acre. I had counseling sessions in my office with affairs. I, I had counseling sessions Sunday with all kinds of stuff going on. They don't need me to come in there and read another chapter of CNN of how terrible things are. Tell them how good Jesus is. And how wonderful it is to be saved by the power of God. When's the last time you got tore up thinking about how good it is just to be saved? Not over the stuff you got. Because it's not a matter of what you got. It's who you got. And all God's people said.